says uh, he described it himself. His career uh, was characterized as a bridge between uh, the humanistic and the uh, and the technical. And uh, this is something that he thought was essential to understand the pharmacist's role in society. And like his predecessors, uh, Kremers and Erdong, uh, he believed that the history, the health sciences, and especially pharmacy required bridges. And uh, I just wanted to end there and say it was a pleasure uh, to get to meet him very briefly. And um, I hope we all remember him. Very good, Lucas, thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation. And I wonder now if we might just pause for a moment of silence in memory of Glenn and in support of his family. Thank you. We celebrate another milestone today. Um, at the outset of today's meeting, we thought it would be appropriate to take a moment to recognize that 2021 marks the 80th anniversary of the founding of the American Institute of the History of Pharmacy. It was established January 22nd, 1941, when the six founders of the Institute met at the University of Wisconsin-Madison to sign the Articles of Organization. Among the various provisions in that document was a statement of the purpose of the Institute. As we gather here today, 80 years later, it, I think it's useful to review that original statement of the Institute's purpose. So according to AIHP's original articles of organization, the purposes of the Institute were, and I'm now quoting, A, to act as an American center for research and information on historical and social aspects of pharmacy, and to assist the professional development of all branches of pharmacy on the basis of historical knowledge and interpretation. B, to foster investigations, publications, study, and interest in the history of pharmacy. C, to collect historical records of pharmacy, making them available publicly and permanently and finally, to provide other such historical services to its members and the profession of pharmacy that appear proper and in the best interests of the Institute. I'm struck by how that original statement of the Institute's purpose remains an accurate statement of our goals and purposes today, 80 years later. The world and the field of pharmacy have certainly changed in dramatic and profound ways since 1941, and of course, AIHP has seen dramatic changes as well. But I think it's useful to see that the purposes for which AIHP was found was created all those decades ago remain both unchanged and still vitally important today. And it is our important duty to see that AIHP continue to serve these purposes for the next 80 years. Our year in review. In lieu of five individual officer reports, we are utilizing a new approach this year. Uh, so Dennis Berkey will lead us through 2021, the year in review, a report on a consolidated review of the major developments and accomplishments of the Institute this past year. Dennis? Great, uh, is my screen up, uh, appearing? Yes. So as Clark said, we're trying something new this year. Rather than having a series of reports from the historical director, the executive director, the president, treasurer, and secretary, this year we're presenting a single year in review report. In this report, we will try to provide you with the same kinds of information as in the past, but we hope to uh, present it in a, at a brisker pace uh, with less repetition uh, and hopefully with more interesting in, in a more interesting and visual way. <clears throat> Our goal is to provide you with a brief report that informs you of the most important accomplishments and developments here at the Institute over the past year. So with that, let's get started. <clears throat> the first thing on our list of accomplishments is AIHP's uh, strategic priorities planning process. During uh, 2021, uh, the board of directors and Institute staff have devoted an incredible amount of time and effort to selecting a short list of strategic priorities that we will focus on during the next three years. 
we undertook this process because we all recognize that while there are many things that AIHP might try to do to, uh, to accomplish its, miss its mission, the best way to make sure that we make real and tangible progress is to agree upon a short list of goals and to commit ourselves to focusing on them uh, in the next three years. Uh, we're going to provide you with a separate uh, longer report in a few minutes that reviews these selected priorities, but suffice to say that for purposes of this year in review report, we view our strategic uh, priorities planning process as one of our major accomplishments of the year. Our second major accomplishment uh, has been in the area of publications. During 2021, we published the last issue of our academic journal under the name of uh, Pharmacy and History, and we are on the cusp of publishing the first issue of the journal under its new name, History of Pharmacy and Pharmaceuticals. 2021 also marked the beginning of our new publication arrangement with the University of Wisconsin Press. The process of rebranding our journal has taken an immense amount of time and effort. It has not simply been a process of slapping a new masthead uh, on the journal. Editor-in-Chief Lucas Rickert and Managing Editor Greg Bond have taken this opportunity to re-examine virtually every aspect of the design and layout of the journal. And we think you're going to love the look and feel of the new journal. And while we're proud of how it looks, uh, we're equally proud of the contents of this issue. Uh, it has a terrific lineup of articles and book reviews. The issue is now available for viewing online on JSTOR, and all members will receive the issue in the mail within the next two to three weeks. Speaking of mailings, I'm pleased to report that the 2022 uh, AIHB calendar is being printed as we speak. We expect it to be mailed next week and members should receive it in the coming weeks well before the beginning of the new year. During 2021, one of our major goals has been to provide our members with more published online material related to the history of pharmacy and pharmaceuticals beyond what we publish in our academic journal. We know that our members are interested uh, in a whole range of topics relating to the history of pharmacy and that while they're interested in the type of, uh, of academic research article that we publish in History of Pharmacy and Pharmaceuticals, they also enjoy reading shorter, less formal articles that explore aspects of pharmacy history and drugs. During 2021, we've taken some significant steps to address this need in two ways. One way has been to expand our relationship with the AACP History of Pharmacy Special Interest Group. For the past several years, we've been impressed that the newsletter of the special interest group has been publishing high quality and, and interesting feature articles on a wide range of pharmacy history topics. But few AIHP members have access to all of those great articles. And so over the past year, we've worked out arrangements with AACP so that AIHP members can now access uh, those articles through our website and our, and our newsletter eScripts. We hope that uh, Institute members will take advantage of this new feature and read these great articles. Special uh, thanks go to uh, AIHP board member Kathy Taglieri for taking the lead in making this project work. The second thing we've done in 2021 is to enter into an arrangement with the Alcohol and Drug History Society to jointly sponsor a blog called Points. The blog allows us to publish two or three posts every week prepared by contributors from a variety of rack backgrounds that explore the aspects of the history of drugs, medicines, alcohol, pharmacy, and pharmaceuticals. The goal of the blog is to bring together contributors with wide ranging expertise to produce original and thoughtful reflections uh, on the history of these topics uh, and plus put them uh, in the context of popular culture. If you haven't started reading uh, points, I hope you'll do so in, in the coming year. There's uh, the slide points. <clears throat> In the area of programming, AIHP has had several significant accomplishments during 2021. Under the, the direction of historical director Luke uh, Rickert, AIHP and several partner organizations sponsored the second annual uh, Edward, Kremer sem Edward Kremer's seminar in the history of pharmacy and drugs. This year's seminar, as we call it, explored the theme of opiates and opioids and featured a series of six weekly lectures. 
the 2021 Preminar was a great success and we look forward to repeating it in 2022. Another programming uh, related achievement in 2021 was AIHP's online exhibit called the Misappropriation of Native Indigenous Imagery in Pharmaceutical Advertising. We plan to offer more online exhibits like this in the future. In fact, in just a few weeks, we'll be opening another online exhibit called Contested Cannabis, a history of marijuana in Wisconsin and the wider world. We'll, be hosting, we'll also be hosting an online program relating, relating to this exhibit on December 8, uh, led by historical director Lou Frickert. We hope you'll join us for that program. <clears throat> As part of our programming in 2021, we were pleased to award two $2,000 AIHP PhD support grants. These grants are helping two promising historians complete their dissertation research on some very interesting pharmacy history topics. AIHP's awards uh, program uh, is an important part of our annual programming and 2021 was a particularly busy year for that program. During the year, we conducted competitions for three major awards, the George Erdong Medal, the AIHP uh, Robert Fischelis Award, and the AIHP Glenn Sonnendecker Prize. And we selected three very worthy recipients for each of these awards. In addition, we awarded six uh, AIHP certificates of commendation to five individuals and one organization for special projects that advance the history of pharmacy and pharmaceuticals in some significant way. And we awarded uh, AIHP student certificates of recognition to 17 pharmacy students during the 2020-21 uh, uh, academic year to recognize their academic achievements or special activities in the area of pharmacy history. The Institute has devoted much time and attention to our historical collections during 2021, and we're pleased with the progre progress we've made. One of uh, AIHP's strategic priorities is to increase the accessibility of our historical collections. AIHP has very valuable and important collections, but many of the collections are not well cataloged or described. We also know that more of our collections need to be digitized so that researchers and our, me and, and our members can access images of those important artifacts and documents online. We still have a long way to go, but we've made very real progress during 2021 to laying the groundwork uh, to significantly increase the accessibility of our collections. During the year, we've added two collections assistant to, assistants to our staff who are busy generating uh, descriptions of our collection that we will use to create online inventories of the collections as well as finding aids. They are also working on digitizing, uh, digitizing images of the collection. We started the process of uploading both the descriptions uh, of the collections and images uh, to our new online digital uh, library platform. Our efforts to increase the accessibility of our collections are truly a work in progress, but please stay tuned. By the end of 2022, we expect uh, to have made a lot more progress. Moving to financial matters, we are pleased to report that the Institute has had a stable year during 2021 from a financial standpoint. We finished our fiscal year on June 30 with a balanced budget. Between June 30, 2021, I'm sorry, June 30, 2020 and June 30, 2021, uh, the Institute's assets have increased by uh, $222,000 thanks to a bullish stock market that pushed up the value of our investment portfolio. On a less positive note, we experienced a significant decrease in membership revenue during the fiscal year that ended uh, on June 30 compared to the preceding year. This lost revenue was offset, however, by the fact that AIHP qualified for a federal Paycheck Protection Program grant for $29,000. I mentioned earlier that the, stock, that the market value of our investment portfolio had increased. Over the past year, the, the rate of return on the, on the portfolio was slightly more than 13%, and the year-to-date return uh, is slightly less than 7%. We've taken some significant steps during 2021 uh, to modernize and improve how we manage AIHP's investment portfolio. We've, we have formed a five person investment committee that will be, will be responsible uh, for overseeing the management of the portfolio. We've also developed and the board of uh, directors has approved 
a new investment policy statement that has clarified our in investment objectives and policies. The new statement is designed to put in place policies that will allow the portfolio to generate a rate of return that will not only allow us uh, that will allow us to not only distribute up to a 5% of the portfolio's market value each year to support the institute's annual operations but it will also provide a rate of return that will preserve the long-term value of the portfolio after accounting for inflation finally we've taken in, uh, we've entered into a new investment management arrangement with our financial advisor that we believe will allow us to increase the value of our portfolio over the long term since AIHP is a member-based organization, this year in review, review report would not be complete if we did not report on the status of membership. A, a copy of the complete membership report is, is available online if you'd like to review it. Uh, the report sadly indicates that our membership continues to decrease. Uh, we currently have 415 members compared with 471 members at this time last year. However, that reduction of 56 members is not as bad as it at first appears. The decrease is largely attributable to the fact that in 2021, we stopped including libraries that sus subscribe to our journal in our membership uh, account because these libraries are now required to subs subscribe for the journal uh, directly through the publisher. This change accounts for 42 of the 56 lost members which means that if we compared, uh, compare last year's count with this year's current count on an apples to apples basis, we had a net loss of only 14 members during the year. We hope this downward uh, trend will discontinue as we uh, uh, work on improving AIHP's publications, uh, in, in increasing the number and quality of our uh, programs and to otherwise increase the value of membership benefits. Overall, despite the COVID pandemic and all the difficulties it has created, 2021 was a remarkably good year at AIHP. We've accomplished a lot and we look forward to continuing that progress in 2022. I'd like to thank the Institute staff for their hard work and dedication during the year. And on behalf of the staff, we'd like to uh, thank uh, the members of the Board of Directors for the many hours they have volunteered uh, over the past year to advance the work of the Institute. And we'd also like to thank uh, AIHP members um, who have volunteered their time and effort uh, to support the work of the mission. And in particular, I'd like to thank, uh, I'd like to extend my special thanks to Bill Zellmer. Uh, in his role as AIHP's advisor for pharmacy outreach, Bill has devoted many, many hours promoting the Institute and the broader community and he has always been willing to assist me and to take on special projects for the Institute. He deserves our special recognition and gratitude for all he has done. Thank you, Bill. Uh, and then finally, um, on behalf of Luke and myself, I'd like to express our thanks and gratitude to Clark Ridgeway, uh, our retiring president, for all of the time he has devoted to AIHP over the, his two-year term as president. Uh, Clark, it's been wonderful to work with you, um, and I'm going to miss you. Um, and that concludes the year in review report. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dennis. I remind uh, attendees to please use the chat function if you can and locate it at the bottom of your screen for any questions or comments. We'll have time for, uh, for questions and answers at the end of the meeting as well. Greg Bond, do we have any comments, questions? I don't see anything in the chat at this point. No, Clark. Okay. Could I, could oh. I, could I just ask a question? Sure. Verbally? Cool. So, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> also, I'm going to test my audio. With the, um, with the membership decreases, kind of thinking about the strategy that we mentioned, you know, I think that we have a lot of value. I mean, I, obviously, I'm biased, right? But, um, you know, to what extent, I, I guess, when we, you know, do out, make outreach to other organizations or present at other meetings, I mean, do we have a plan for, I guess, more proactive engagement, right? I mean, would we even consider like a booth someplace? Would we even consider, you know, encouraging members when they get, because I've given this presentation several times and I don't know that I've given like a pitch to AHP membership in there. I've just, just thought of that and I, I could, and I would like to. I just, I mean, do we have any sense of strategy for, 
being sort of active with the outreach now that we have sort of the presence online to kind of add fear value for those that go to the website and visit it? Uh, it's a goal that we have. Uh, it's a matter of having the resources uh, to staff a program like that, and, and in particular, uh, uh, the uh, having a, uh, an individual on staff who's dedicated to simply that work. Uh, all of us try to do uh, membership solicitations. Uh, it's, in, it's something that I recognize that is very important. I have uh, trouble finding a significant amount of time that I can dedicate to that with all of the other things that we're trying to do. Uh, it's my goal that at some point in the not too distant future we will be uh, in a position where we can uh, take on a staff person who will be dedicated to that uh, and can work on that on an ongoing consistent basis. Uh, until then, uh, we make do as best we can. But, uh, you know, uh, something Bill Zelmer has uh, told members of the board of directors over the years many times, and I'll repeat it to all of you. You know, the best way to promote membership is for all of us uh, to talk to our friends uh, uh, and you know fellow pharmacists and other historians uh, about this organization, the value that we see in it, and and how it might help them, uh, or at least uh, it might uh, 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 pursue, allow them to pursue their interest in the history of pharmacy and pharmaceuticals. So um, you know the the uh, your recommendations to friends and colleagues would be most welcomed. Okay. Uh, Clark and uh, Dennis, this is Bill Zelmer. I noticed that um, Angie Long is uh, on uh, attending the meeting here. That's great. A few years ago, Angie and the task force developed uh, some rather comprehensive recommendations for uh, expanding the membership of the Institute. And I think when uh, the Institute gets uh, equipped from a staffing point to uh, pursue this more rigorously, there's a good roadmap there, I believe, that uh, we could follow. There is indeed. Uh, that will be one of Angie Long's uh, long legacies uh, from her work on this board. Very good. Thank you. Uh, you know, it's amazing. Despite uh, yet another year of pandemic-related uh, limitations, um, it's been a remarkably productive uh, year for the Institute. And I'd like to add my personal thanks to all the staff and the officers and uh, Institute members who uh, contributed efforts that are reflected in this report. Moving on to the report on AIHP strategic priorities for the next three years. Again, Dennis. Thank you. Um, uh, I said a few things about our, our strategic uh, priorities process already, uh, but uh, since we're going to be devoting a lot of time to this over the next three years, and since you're going to be hearing a lot about it over the next three years, we thought it deserves a slightly more detailed report. Um, and, and I first wanted to say a few things about why we've undertaken uh, this, uh, this, the, these strategic priorities. Uh, Luke and I are both finishing our third role, our third year in our respective roles as with Luke as historical director and me as executive director. And over those years, we have, of course, developed plans for how we want the Institute to move forward. And we've been sharing those plans with the board of directors and the board of directors too has their, their own uh, goals and visions for the Institute. As we've been grappling with these plans and with these various goals, it became clear to all of us uh, that um, we would benefit from having a simple and concise statement of, uh, uh, of a set of mutually agreed upon uh, overarching priorities for the Institute. This set of overarching priorities will help guide us, uh, in, our, uh, guide us in our work in our respective roles and will help us decide what is truly important in order to, uh, for us to achieve our shared vision for the Institute. In order to develop these overarching priorities, the board and staff spent uh, a lot of time reflecting on our, on our various goals and aspirations. And from these discussions, we came to see that, there, uh, that uh, our, our goals and aspirations seemed to coalesce around four central themes or ideas. And those ideas uh, became the basis for the uh, strategic priorities we selected. I think it's important to have an understanding of what the priorities are intended to do and what they are not intended to do. Uh, these priorities are not going to result in any radical changes in our existing uh, operations. 
We're still going to continue publishing uh, two issues of our journal every year. We're going to continue uh, our awards program. Uh, we'll, we will offer programs and meetings, even though those specific things may not be mentioned in the strategic priorities. But over the next three years, uh, you should expect to see us giving special attention and focus to the four goals that we've selected. These, prior, uh, th these priorities are not a statement of the only things that we will be working on during the next three years, but I believe it's accurate to say that these priorities will help to shape and uh, will help to shape and influence almost everything we do during the coming years. Uh, and so with that, uh, I'm quickly going to review our priorities. Uh, first, uh, uh, our first priority is to increase the accessibility of AIHP's historical collections. Our second is to increase our operating revenues by at least $50,000 annually. Third, we want to increase our partnerships and collaborations with pharmacy, pharmaceutical, and historical organizations. And finally, we want to integrate and promote diversity, equity, and inclusion in all aspects of AIHP's programs and operations. I'm going to say a few words about each of these and also identify some of our specific action items for this. First, with respect to the accessibility of our historical collections, you know, we recognize that we have a truly valuable and unique collection of, of pharmacy and pharmaceutical related materials here. Um, uh, it, it, it's an incredibly valuable uh, thing. Uh, the problem is that uh, the researchers and our members and others who are interested in this material uh, have a hard time accessing it. Um, and so it will be one of our priorities to address that problem. And I should say that we're doing this not only because we want to make it make uh, in order, we want to make our existing collection more accessible, but this is also designed to help promote uh, uh, additional uh, uh, contributions to our collections over the next 80 years. If we're going to remain a vital organization, we will need ongoing contributions to our archives uh, and our artifacts. And so the specific things that we're going to be uh, focused on are developing detailed collection lists and inventories. Uh, as well as finding aids and then making these available online. We're going to be focused on um, digitizing select portions of the collections. Our collection is so huge, it's not conceivable that we're going to digitize everything, but we're going to be focusing upon uh, 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 select portions uh, that we believe is, are, are, are especially important uh, and should be available. Finally, we've, uh, uh, earlier this year, we selected a, a new platform to serve as our digital library. And uh, in the coming years, we're going to be focused on, on developing that and populating that uh, with uh, 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 digitized, digitized uh, 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 versions of our collections. And then finally, our goal is to uh, overall promote and increase the, aware, uh, and the awareness uh, of our collections. With respect to our uh, the increase in operating revenues, you know we recognize that we are a resource-starved organization. Uh, we have many goals that we simply cannot pursue because we we lack uh, resources in terms of the staff and other things uh, in which to pursue them. And so uh, we are being very intentional about trying to find ways to increase our revenues. Uh, we're going to be looking at a variety of ways. We hope to increase membership revenues through. Uh, uh, measured increases in membership dues, uh, but also uh, increasing our, our membership counts. Uh, we get a significant amount of membership. We get a significant amount of our support from our national association sponsors, and we want to expand that program uh, in the coming years. Uh, probably the most significant way to make real headway in funding our needs is finding uh, grants, uh, and we will be uh, very focused and intentional about that. Um, finally, we're going to look for ways to increase uh, annual giving uh, to the Institute separate from membership dues. And then finally, we're, we hoped uh, during the next three years uh, to be able to establish a planned giving program uh, that will increase support to the Institute through bequ be uh, bequests uh, and other planned gifts. Our third goal in the, uh, is to increase partnerships and collaborations with pharmacy, pharmaceutical, and historical organizations. You know, we recognize that sometimes the Institute is too inward looking and we, we need to be uh, more conscious of being out, uh, outward looking and to 
uh, to look for partnerships and opportunities to work with uh, organizations that share our goals and interests. Um, and so we're going to be fo uh, focused upon this in a couple of ways. First, uh, we want to collaborate more closely with our national sponsors on, on uh, mutually beneficial projects. Uh, you know, these are these national association sponsors uh, have shown special interest in us, and we want to reciprocate uh, by uh, helping them with pharmacy relating projects and frankly, help, uh, working with them to allow us to pursue uh, pharmacy history projects through through them and with their help. Uh, over the next three years, we intend to spend a lot of time reinvigorating our relationship with uh, pharmacy education in a number of ways. One of the ways will be to reconceptualize our pharmacy education fund, which is kind of the membership category uh, for pharmacy schools and colleges, but it needs, it needs to be fundamentally rethought and restructured. Uh, another goal will be to promote and support the teaching of history and uh, the, the, the teaching of history of pharmacy uh, in schools and, and colleges. And we're going to be doing that in a couple of ways. Uh, one way uh, is to participate actively in the uh, newly started ACPE uh, 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 project uh, to uh, uh, modernize and, and, and revisit uh, the uh, the standards, including curriculum standards for, for PharmD programs. We've already established a task force that's working in that area. They've put together an initial statement that we intend to file with ACPE um, be, be, uh, in the coming weeks. So work is well underway there already. Uh, in addition, we want to do more uh, to provide support to uh, pharmacy school faculty members who are teaching uh, uh, history of pharmacy classes or modules or, or, or uh, programs. Um, and then finally, in, in the education area, we want to further deepen our ties with the AACP History of Pharmacy Special Interest Group. You know, we share uh, a common mission with that group, uh, and we think that, uh, that closer work with them will allow us to better pursue our mission. And then finally, in the area of collaborations, uh, we want to update our online directory of, of, of US-based pharmacy school, um, museums and archives. We have an existing directory online, uh, but it's 20 plus years old. Uh, it desperately needs to be updated. As part of this process of up updating this uh, directory, we also hope to uh, uh, further a, a kind of an informal network uh, with all of these museums and archives to better uh, facilitate communications uh, with these groups. And then finally, um, it's an important goal for us to integrate and promote uh, DEI principles in all aspects of AIHP's programs and operations. Um, I mean, I think we all recognize that any responsible organization uh, after the events of last year uh, needs to be conscious and intentional uh, about um, um, uh, examining uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and we intend to be at the forefront of that. Uh, one of the ways we wanna do that is to develop a DEI value statement. We've already uh, appointed a task force uh, to start that process. We've had our initial meeting and we hope to have a, uh, a value statement ready for the board's uh, consideration uh, no later than uh, the summer of next year. Uh, we also intend to work on diversifying the, the composition of AIHP's board of directors. Uh, we've been conscious of this for several years already, uh, but we recognize that it remains too male and, and, and too white. Uh, and uh, we intend to uh, address that. We, I, I want, want to be upfront in saying that you know, diversity is not the only value we bring to uh, consider when we are looking for uh, potential uh, board members. Uh, but with this statement, we are making clear that uh, diversity is an important element uh, and important criteria um, when we select directors. Uh, over the next three years, we intend to uh, uh, bring uh, DEI uh, issues uh, to our programming uh, and to issues uh, uh, of our journals, in, including uh, history of pharmacy uh, and pharmaceuticals. So you can expect to see those issues coming up in that way. And then finally, um, we uh, want to increase our engagement and outreach to pharmacy organizations and, and institutions that serve 
uh, under underrepresented groups uh, in the profession. Uh, we've not done enough in, in this area, uh, and uh, uh, we see this as a real opportunity uh, to uh, uh, change to, to to expand our membership, uh, but also to bring in people with new viewpoints uh, and uh, and that can uh, help change. Um, uh, uh, you know. Uh, the kinds of things we do here at the Institute. So that's that's our, a quick review of our strategic priorities and the action items uh, that we've developed to uh, to pursue them over the next three years. Mark? Thank you, Dennis, for, uh, for a very uh, extensive report on our strategic priorities. Uh, again, we'll take a moment for any comments or questions uh, via chat. Greg, are you seeing any pop-up? No? I am not. Okay. Um, I think uh, everyone in the Institute owes a great deal of thanks to the members of the Board of Directors and the staff, who I can tell you devoted many, many hours and a lot of effort to create the plan that was uh, just presented. It is truly an am ambitious set of goals. It is now time on the agenda for what we typically consider the highlight of this meeting, which is an historical lecture. This continues a tradition at our annual business meeting that uh, we include a scholarly lecture. We believe it is consistent with AIHP's mission of providing historical information uh, to its members and others. And we believe that it creates more interest and participation in our meeting by uh, the membership. Uh, again, if time permits, we will take questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, Dr. Rickert, would you please introduce our speakers and their topic? Sure. Hi, Ben. Hi, Christian. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here with us today. Uh, uh, Ms. Christian Brown is a PharmD candidate at the UNC uh, Eshelman School of Pharmacy and uh, Ms. Brown is also collaborating uh, on the UNC Pharmacy Desegregation Oral History Project, which is uh, collecting and recording the uh, experiences of uh, first Black students at the UNC School of Pharmacy. And we're lucky to have you with us uh, today. Uh, whereas uh, Ben Urich, uh, he's an assistant professor uh, in the, in the uh, UNC Eshelman School of Pharmacy. And um, it's brilliant as well that he is an editorial board member of uh, uh, the, the Institute's journal, History of Pharmacy and Pharmaceuticals, where his perspective is most welcome. And personally, he's just a great colleague. And so we're lucky to have you involved with the organization and we're lucky to have both of you present to us today. I'll turn it over to you too. That's great. Thank you very much, Luke. And Christian, you're, you're on the uh, presentation for slides, correct? I am. The meeting has to Good deal. Part ah, so could somebody let us share our slides? Um, as that gets worked out by somebody in HP. Yes, I hope Greg will turn to that in a I moment. I see. I see. I see Greg walking around I, a couple I think, different screens. Yeah. Uh, Dennis, can you make Christian a co-host? I don't yes, seem to I have know. that power. There hey, go. there we go. Okay. So, um, thank you very much to um, Luke, Greg, Dennis, everybody else at AHP for inviting us to uh, present. This is work that we've actually collaborated, collaborated with uh, Greg Bond on. The origin of this was actually I think uh, cocktail now hour at the International Congress for the History of Pharmacy in DC in 2019. Uh, Greg said, you know, there is some really interesting history with uh, um, desegregation and the UNC School of Pharmacy. I said, do tell. And he talked about this case called Hoka v. Wilson. So Hoka v. Wilson, it was the first ever case to desegregate any institution of higher education in the South that the NAACP took part in. Um, and I had I had no idea. And so um, the, the kind of that conversation is outside the scope. The uh, short version is um, HOCA was not successful, but NAACP learned a lot from that case. 
And uh, that started a string of um, successful lawsuits to forcefully desegregate institutions of higher learning, starting in most cases with um, graduate programs, law in particular, uh, and then eventually the undergraduate campus. So <clears throat> this presentation is focused on the UNC Eshman School of Pharmacy. Um, we have a longer presentation where we um, incorporate that history uh, of um, desegregation of, of Southern schools of pharmacy, more of Southern institutions more broadly, uh, schools of pharmacy in particular, and also dig into a little bit more of the North Carolina history. Um, also want to say an especial welcome to Fred Eckel, uh, not to call Fred Eckel out for being, uh, uh, for having, having recognized Fred's experience, and Fred was also had uh, the opportunity to actually be at UNC during some of what we're talking about now. So Fred, it's great to have you um, joining the presentation and of course, as a longtime member of the Institute as well. So as we talk about the history of the School of Pharmacy with um, Beard Hall, Christian, we got the next slide there. I was in it working for you. I got a little, there we go, perfect. So this is, this is, this is Beard Hall. This is, uh, this is brand new at the 19, uh, 1959 was, it was built. This is brand new when the events we're talking about occur. As we look at the um, makeup of the graduating classes uh, of students at UNC throughout time, we can see the first student to graduate from the School of Pharmacy is 1967. Uh, this is divided by race, um, as you can see at the bottom. Um, black graduates are represented in the color blue, and it's all the way at the bottom. Uh, white makes up, of course, most of these are Caucasian, depending on how to define it. So the first ever graduate was 1967. We will be sharing her story. And you can see, and as is the case for most institutions of, of higher education and pharmacy as well, that um, desegregation did not mean integration. We had the first student graduate in, in um, 67, then 69, then 72. And then students do, do pick up, but it's, it's not as if there's ever a large corpus. So you can see uh, the first nine students, uh, there were fewer than nine students who graduated within the first um, 10 years after desegregation of the School of Pharmacy, starting with William Wicker, Mona Boston Reddick, and Jimmy Barnes, whose stories we'll be sharing today. So, for Mr. Wicker, to give a bit more background on him, born in 1942, um, I became very excited about this when I realized not only did the first black students who attend the School of Pharmacy, was he still alive, he was actually still practicing. Um, so that's when I was talking to Greg and I was like, we gotta capture this story. So uh, Mr. Wicker was born to a single parent home in Forsyth County. That's in the Winston-Salem area, about I'd say an hour and a half west of Chapel Hill. It was a poor um, working class neighborhood, um, segregated neighborhood as was the case in North Carolina at that time. Um, strong community support, talks about feeling very safe there. He said that they could leave the front door open and all the windows open at night and would never have to worry about um, anybody breaking in. Again, felt very comfortable, attended church as well. Did attend segregated schools as again, was not only norm, was the law in North Carolina at that time. Uh, and he got to start working in a black owned pharmacy in Winston-Salem at age 12. So when he came to UNC, We've got, um, his, his experience was um, fairly typical of, of students uh, at the time who were, who were black students entering into what were not only predominantly white, but 99.9% .9 white institutions. Um, in his words, the School of Pharmacy didn't even know he was black until he got down there. Um, he sort of arrived on campus and then his race was discovered. Um, Legal precedent at that time said that they could not bar him from, from uh, enrolling, but that does not mean that he was welcomed. Um, you know, as, as he talked about here with the first quote, um, the pharmacy, uh, College of Pharmacy, School of Pharmacy was the coldest environment he'd ever been in. Um, the other kids really sort of didn't really acknowledge his presence. Um, he went to football games. He, he did things that other students did. But it was sort of like, um, you know, being, uh, having a spotlight shining on you, as the second quote talks about, where you're in the crowd, you're there, um, there's, it's going to sort of stick out in that sense, and there's nothing that you could do about it. Um, his experience during his first couple of years was, you know, again, not only cold, but in, in his recollection, somewhat hostile. Um, there was, uh, and the number two at the School of Pharmacy, gentleman by the last name of Chambers, William Chambers, um, told his employer in Winston-Salem that he would never graduate 
from the School of Pharmacy. Um, and in Mr. Wicker's recollection, that was um, at least in part due to, to his, 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 his race, um, him being the first black student to enroll in the School of Pharmacy. To capture some of his experience, we have I had a fellow tell me that his um, words. one of my classmates tell me, and we actually worked together later at, at the CBS store. He told me, he said, you said, every time I see you, I think you're sitting in a white uh, kid's seat. Uh, and I said, uh, you know, I said, I earned my seat. You know, I said, I qualify for the seat and I belong in the seat. Now, this, yeah, your friend may not be here, but I'm not the reason he's not here. Because they probably looked at both of us and decided which was which was coming, which was not. And the fact that I came in as a white student, I didn't come in as a as a black student. <laughs> they didn't know I was black until I got down there uh, that they could open all the things with me. So I, so I qualified to, to sit in this seat. But uh, he later uh, became one of my very good friends. Uh, attitude changed as as because he had not known any anybody up close and personal black before. And so his his attitude changed, but uh, that's what he told me that I was sitting in a white kid's seat. Had a fellow. So the experience he had there was so adverse that he actually left the school for a period of time, um, worked in that same pharmacy for five years, but was always determined to come back um, and did so in 1970 and graduated in 1972. Um, as the third um, black graduate from the School of Pharmacy. So when he came back, he found the environment to be much different. Um, it was much less cold. There was a new dean. The dean came down from the north. There were new faculty members who came down from the north as well. Actually, uh, Fred Eckel is one of those new faculty members that came down from the north um, who, who brought with him a different set of experiences than the um, previous set of faculty members who were predominantly from, from the south. So that is, a, uh, and a, as I've talked about from his work experience, um, he is still a practicing uh, pharmacist, um, fills in part-time, has had a variety of community pharmacy experiences, um, and, uh, and again, still, still works uh, part-time for independent pharmacy out in the greater Winston-Salem area. So that's the experience of um, William Wicker uh, moving forward to Mona Boston Reddick. Now we have Ms. Mona Boston Reddick, and she was actually the first black graduate from the School of Pharmacy. She came in during the in-between years from when time between Mr. Ricker left the school and when he came back to finish. She was raised in Shawtown, which is outside of Wilmington, North Carolina, and that is about 30, 45 minutes southeast of Raleigh, the capital of North Carolina. Different family situation than Mr. Wicker. She was raised mother and father in the home, youngest of three daughters. Both her parents were college educated. Very notably, her father was the agricultural agent in the county, a very tight knit community. Um, and he was very instrumental in getting resources to Shawtown, which was the quote unquote black side of town. She started her college career at the Hampton Institute where one of her parents went in Virginia. She went in 1962, stayed three years before transferring to the University of North Carolina College of Pharmacy. And that was because her father had heard that UNC was beginning to integrate. And so the lot fell to her among her sisters to quote, go down there and do all that hard work. Um, but she was very pleased to transfer to the school and begin her pharmacy career. Her experience at UNC was overall very positive. She had a great time, had lots of friends, both black and white, all across the university, went to the sporting events, went to the dances. She had a wonderful time at UNC. She was even invited to join the Kappa Epsilon fraternity, which was very unusual for black students to be invited to white Greek life at the time. And here is a clip of how she describes her welcome to the UNC School of Pharmacy. When I first came to UNC, the dean scheduled an appointment with me to come to the building at 11 a.m. So much to my surprise, there were not police cars or marshals or people trying to protect the crowd, but there was a long sidewalk up to Beard Hall. It was Beard Hall then. 
And I walked from the sidewalk to the front door. This is what happened. The whole student body was lined up on both sides of the uh, sidewalk. And I walked it alone and they were friendly. And when I got to the door, the dean opened it and said, welcome to the School of Pharmacy. I want you to remember that you are the first. So at this point, the dean that had welcomed Mr. Wicker, or not welcome, but put up with, that was Dean Brecht, he was out at this point. And we had interim Dean Marsh for about six months. Another northerner came over from public health. And so when Ms. Reddick was welcomed to the school, you heard her say that, I want you to know that you are the first. It is very likely that interim Dean Marsh had not even known about Mr. Wicker or he had left the school by then and then interim Dean comes in. So then the Dean Marsh also from the North came around, turned this whole culture around being from the North where segregation was not as welcomed. And Ms. Reddick continued to have a great time at UNC for the two years that she was there. She transferred in 65, graduated in 67. She graduated under Dean Hager, Air Force gentleman from the North. And it was a little bit odd at her graduation. She describes having a wonderful time, but then Dean Hager instructed her to come for her diploma after most of the students had already picked up theirs. Ms. Reddick wasn't sure why there was not a reason given why, but as you can tell from this quote, she didn't mind that she was happy to avoid whatever troubles that there might have been. In her pharmacy career, she completed her one year internship post baccalaureate at the New York Mount Sinai Hospital. She recalls that she was the first pharmacy intern there. She told us a story actually of how some police FBI agents from North Carolina actually came all the way to New York City to question the integrity of her pharmacy license. They did not believe that a black student could score so high on her licensing exam and they came to find out if it was real. So they came and they got their assurances that her license was legit and then they left. No explanations, no follow-up, nothing. Eventually, she did return to North Carolina where she worked at NC Memorial Hospital. Our dear Professor Echo hired her on there. Um, and she was, however, um, left her position at the hospital, whether she was denied a promotion or other reasons. And she joined the School of Pharmacy at UNC and took on an instructorship. She conducted drug abuse outreach before she ultimately left the workforce to raise her two daughters. Okay, and finally for, for Jimmy Barnes. So Jimmy Barnes was the um, second black student to graduate from the UNC Eshman School, from the UNC School of Pharmacy. Uh, he graduated two years after uh, Ms. Rennick. Um, and Jimmy was, if we can, Christian, give me one more sign. There we go. Grew up in Greenville, North Carolina, uh, highly segregated at the time. Mother owned a beauty shop. Uh, we interviewed him. He took a lot of pride in the fact that his mother had never worked for a white person. She'd always worked for herself with this beauty shop. Father had a variety of jobs, um, finished, uh, left school after eighth grade, eventually got a GED. Uh, and Mr. Barnes refers to him as one of the smartest people he's ever met, um, who could do a variety of jobs and, and was, has been an inspiration for um, Mr. Barnes his entire life. Worked part time at a uh, pharmacy, which was his inspiration to joining, um, to, to becoming a pharmacist. And wanted to go to Howard, but his family decided if we can get in-state tuition and uh, the UNC schools are, are opening up to, to uh, black students, then that's where you're going to be. So um, his experience at uh, UNC was um, fairly similar 
to Mr. Wickers. Um, again, said he didn't feel like he belonged at all. Wanted to pack his bags, come back home. His father told him, "Well, you know, you're you're 18. You can do what you want. I'd be um, I'd be disappointed if if you did, but um, uh, you can do what you want." He decided to to stay and did enjoy it. He found a small group of other students on campus who were there at the same time as him, um, who who became close to, um, and mentioned two faculty members in particular, Steve Kaiola and Fred Eckel, uh, who became faculty mentors to him, who, who made the environment feel much more welcoming um, after his first couple of years there. And in his own words. We got the UNC, as I said, it was a total culture shock. Totally. Uh, that first year, I don't know, I was, I was pretty much lost <laughs> uh, the first year or two. Uh, and I, I got so discouraged, you know, uh, coming from knowing everybody to knowing not anybody. Uh, I actually packed my bags and was ready to go. And I asked daddy if I could, I could just move to, to Washington and work my way into Howard. And he said, well, uh, of course, at the age you are, you, you can drop out. I don't want you to. I would be hurt if you did. I would prefer that you try to stick it out here if you, if you could. And uh, he told me this story about pioneers. He said, you know, pioneers uh, get all the brush in their face. They go first. But they make it better for everyone coming behind you. And it's a matter of paying back in service. You've been blessed uh, to come up through a uh, with good home, and we need to be able to give back. And this would be your way if you would see it that way. So I'm not going to insist that you do it, but I'm going to hope that you do it. So I follow his advice, and I do not regret it until this day. And so uh, for his pharmacy career, um, Mr. Mr. Barnes started in community pharmacy, actually owned a community pharmacy for a period of time. Uh, went from there, worked at a federal, fairly qualified health center, uh, but decided to come back to uh, education and got his uh, master's in health management policy at UNC uh, and ended his career at the UNC hospital um, where he was uh, working with pharmacy recruitment. Uh, and we're getting the slides back up. They disappeared. There we are. No worries. There we go. Got all that right. There we go. Okay. So, um, you know, one one experience that he had that that um, uh, again, just kind of backing up just a little bit. So, at the time, of course, when you graduated from pharmacy school, you had to do a year of of uh, externship before getting your license. Um, he said that there was no white pharmacy in the state that would hire him. I mean, not even working for free. Um, so, so again, you can get the sense of he was allowed to get his degree, uh, but then beyond that, again, this was this was North Carolina in the nineteen sixties. Um, so, moving on from that, as we wrap up with our reflections from the individuals. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, I can provide a, a few of my kind of, um, comments and then, and then Christian, I'd love for you to, to, uh, to close it out. And then we have one final, um, reflection from, from Mr. Barnes. Um, and yeah, let's just go ahead and, and uh, yep. Yeah. My, my granddaughter is turned 14 is, is uh, uh, of course, my wife just reminded me. <laughs> um, I'm not insisting that she go to farm to school or anything. She respects it. She'll make her own decision. Uh, she's the kind of person that will research things. But I'm, I'm happy now that the avenue is there for her to do it if she wants to. You know, uh, at least the, the kids, they can do it if they want to. You know, that's, that's what I was really concerned about. Uh, like before me and before said you, you couldn't, you might want to, uh, but uh, they couldn't do it because of the color of their skin. Now, if they want to, they can. You know, that or, or whatever other profession. I've lived to see that and I'm happy about it. So, so for, for, for me and, um, 
you know, this this project was after I talked with Greg and I realized there was history here that would never been explored. It was an opportunity to to take the diversity, equity, and inclusion um, efforts that were ongoing even at the end of 2019, and of course um, took off in 2020, and to say, you know, we have these stories. These stories can be meaningful. These stories represent. Um, or are you know the, the history uh, with the School of Pharmacy and the way in which the the institutions at the time um, barred um, Black students from receiving uh, equal education, and that history has as bearing on on pharmacy today. I mean, if you look at North Carolina, there was there was no pharmacy school in North Carolina um, before that. If you're and you know you're talking about our gen you know uh, African American pharmacists in the South are probably maybe two generations deep. Um, I see John Clark on here. John has done uh, excellent work documenting some of the early African-American pharmacists. We had, of course, African-American pharmacists before, I'd say the 1940s or 50s, but it was it was very hard for pharmacists to get, get training education. So, you know, that that makes essentially the, the bench short. And so we look at students today and we think sort of what do they have in terms of um, pharmacists who, who look like them, who speak their culture, and that, that bench is pretty shallow because of, because of these, because of, of segregation. And so um, gathering these stories reminds us of that and helps us reflect in a meaningful way on, on our current diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts within the school. Christian? I was particularly excited to get involved in collecting these stories. I remember thinking at the end of interviewing Miss Reddick that I literally wanted her to be my grandmother because she's so amazing. Um, and I remember thinking and realizing that these are the students who laid the groundwork for me to be able to walk through the front doors of my pharmacy school, not the back doors, um, and to be able to sit in the classroom and raise my hand and answer a question in class. And I see in their stories, I see myself in their struggles, but I also see struggles that I never had to go through because they did this for me, not even 80 years ago, as old as AIHP is, far more recent than that. Um, and so I feel very grateful that these alumni we're open to share their stories with us. I'm surprised and encouraged that they all consider themselves proud Tar Heels. Um, they love the UNC School of Pharmacy. Can't wait to come back and walk the halls and see the renovations, um, even after everything that they went through. And so I'm amazed and encouraged and honored that they would share these stories um, and to give us the opportunity to share these stories with you. And so concerning this oral history project, we had some future directions, some ideas about where this would go. So we've been telling everybody at the school, and of course, we're starting to branch out now here with this lecture, hopefully at AACP in the summer. Some of my classmates have also collected the story of our first Asian graduate from the professional program. Her name was Mrs. Tai Bai Kyung in 1963. And I'm always challenging others to get involved in finding and retelling these stories of something almost too recent to be called history. Um, and then of course, when you do get involved with this, not if, but when, always inviting in a member of the people group that you're studying to be an integral part of that studying process. These stories are a good place to start holding each other accountable for productive conversations about racial injustices and disunity. And it's everybody's job here to have meaningful conversations with people that don't look like you, don't think like you, haven't lived like you. And of course, this gives us the opportunity to practice empathy, which is believing somebody's story when they tell you how it is for them. And I would also encourage y'all to really think about how this history applies to you and what you're going to do about this um, at work as the keepers of the history of American pharmacy. And of course, in your personal lives, everybody has a role in this history. And so as Dr. Eric mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, we gave a fuller version of this with Dr. Bond and his research with the desegregation of certain schools of pharmacy, um, and then an extended version of Mr. Wicker and Ms. Reddick's stories. Mr. Barnes' story was not in there, but extended versions of theirs. We were also invited to write a post for the points blog, as we mentioned 
today for the Black History Month series back in February. Um, so that shares Mr. Wicker and Ms. Reddick's stories in written form. And these are their stories of enduring desegregation at the UNC School of Pharmacy and everything they had to go through. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Ben, kindly for that presentation. Fantastic. And maybe people can give you a, a virtual round of applause or, or, or clap like this. Uh, uh, wonderfully generative uh, and um, thought provoking uh, work that you're doing. Uh, I just wanted to say to everyone that we should have a couple of minutes if there are questions uh, that you had for, for Ben or Christian. You've just comments or, or reflection as, as, as well. I mean, this is, you know, affecting and, and um, yeah. Uh, I, this is John Clark. I wanted to comment. I, I'm mm -hmm. impressed with what you've done. I made it one of the reasons because I'm trying to do the same thing and to see what you've done has really, it even motivates me even more to keep working at it. So I honestly, mm -hmm. uh, I really do appreciate it a lot. And, I, and since I've had pe people that are beginning to identify their work that I've started doing, I've gotten calls. Our University of Kansas are interesting. The students, not the faculty, the students have asked me to help them out with a couple of African American graduates from that school. So we're working with, I'm working with them, uh, trying to help uh, give them, provide what I've been able to come up with. Uh, so does uh, Washington State University. They are looking at, um, Lord, I can't forget her name, uh, Jessie Sonora Sims. She's the first graduate in 1908. So I, I, I've gotten a lot of background on her and I shared it with the school and there uh, I'm working with the faculty there who wants to write her story. And so I'm, I'm ha it's been exciting for me and more, very motivating to have other people call me up and they want to do the same thing. And I'm more than happy to jump on board and be a part of it and help where I can. And that's been the thing that I've seen that has happened in the last year or two. And, and to me, it's just been very, very exciting. I'm starting on another project that I don't know when I'll finish it, but I'm in the middle of one now that's coming from all of this, these other exciting people who are getting excited about this and it's helping me, it's motivating me to keep uh, digging a little deeper on it. So I, I really do appreciate what you, what you, what you put together there. And, um, would love to see it and, and share and share and um, indulge in the way some of the things that you you come up with there. And, and the book that I started on, I have to tell you, that's probably my initial goal was to look at everybody in that book, which is a very ambitious goal because there are so many deep stories there. I can I can point out five people that got a probably a whole manuscript you can write on, but I just can't get to it, you know. So. I'm hoping that uh, I just would make an introduction and someone else maybe take off on it. That's what I'm hoping would, would happen. Very good. Thank you, John. Uh, Christian and Ben, I want to thank you both very much for a, a most enlightening and, and timely presentation. Um, and I, I hope you will take some time to read the comments in the chat. They are extremely positive for the work that you've done. I think you all have established a, a template, a model for other schools and for the Institute to follow as we continue to pursue, pursue uh, this historical investigation. I'll remind the group that a copy of the lecture will be made available on the AIHP website. Are there any other comments? or questions. Fred, are you trying to unmute? Somebody with host privileges, you want to unmute? Fred? It doesn't nope. let you unmute other people anymore. Uh, I, I was just, I wanted to, to express my appreciation too for, for very interesting presentation. Uh, I, I uh, lived through it, didn't appreciate it as much then as I do now. Uh, but it was really insightful and helpful. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, Fred, thank you. I mean, I mean, really, I mean, the, you know, um, 
you know, I mean, two of these people called out you, you, you in particular for, for, for being different than who they had seen before and for the relationship that you, that you were willing and wanting to build with them. And it was meaningful. Yes, you're an integral part of this history and creating a welcoming environment. Yeah, and I will mention that these materials are being uh, uh, archived at AHP, um, and so it can be reviewed in full. For each of these, we have an hour and a half long interview that we just showed you, like, you know, a minute and a half from. So there's a lot. There's a lot here, um, full transcripts as well, which certainly can be shared. Very thank you. good. Again, a sincere thank you to both of you for a phenomenal presentation. Wonderful. It's now time to recognize the recipients of this year's uh, major AIHP awards. Uh, Lucas, can you introduce the uh, winner of the George Erdong Medal? Happy to. The AIHP uh, awards the George Erdong Medal biannually to recognize the lifetime achievements of a person who over a sustained period has made important scholarly contributions to the field of the history of pharmacy and pharmaceuticals. And so this past year, 2021, as many of you know, marked a change from previous years. Uh, prior to 2021, the Erdang Medal was awarded for an original and scholarly publication or a series of interrelated publications. And so this change meant uh, that there was um, just a, had to be a new way of judging and thinking. Uh, and that means that the judges have to be called out because they were so incredibly important uh, this year. And uh, I wanna sincerely, sincerely uh, thank all of the judges, uh, Stuart Anderson, Mary Schaefer Conroy, John Paris Gondola, and Maria del Carmen Francis Casepe uh, for taking the time um, your, your service to the Institute uh, and the larger history of pharmacy field uh, in this work as judges is truly invaluable. And so I deeply, deeply appreciate uh, your effort in this regard. Uh, I'll speak for the judges uh, and say that as a group, we agreed that the different nominations and candidates were excellent this year. I was particularly impressed and we were particularly impressed as judges with the wide range of work that's going on around the globe. Uh, after uh, deliberation, the medalist for 2021 is Olivier Lafont, and I want to uh, congratulate him uh, warmly. The letter uh, that the Institute sent to Professor Lafont uh, suggested this and I quote, your work exemplifies the scholarship the George Erdang Medal seeks to honor. Your publications address varied topics spanning centuries and exhibit scholarship of great breadth and depth. In many ways, your long and productive career highlights and mirrors the humanistic aspirations for pharmacy history put forward 80 years ago by George Erdang. Unquote. I'm not going to say too much more um, because in accordance with past practice, AHP would like to formally present the Erdang Medal to Professor Lafont at the next International Congress for the History of Pharmacy scheduled uh, in Milan, Italy in September 2022. But Professor Lafont, um, I would like to invite you to say a few brief words if you wish. Thank you very much. It's for me a great pleasure to have the opportunity to thank you and to thank all the members of the jury for choosing me for this uh, Erdung Medal. And uh, really, it's a great honor for me. And uh, I am, uh, I thank you deeply for that. I, I am a pharmacist. My, my wife was a pharmacist. My parents were pharmacists. I have two grand grandfathers who were pharmacists. My grand grand grandfather was a pharmacist. So I was born in pharmacy and history of pharmacy has been always the interest of my life. 
So it's a great pleasure for me to receive this reward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Congratulations from everyone. And maybe we can all give them a clap if you haven't already. And I look forward to seeing you in Milan. Of course. Let me add my congratulations, Professor LaFont. Well-deserved. Uh, Dennis, you had the honor of presenting this year's AIHP Fischelis Award. I did. The Institute established the AIHP Robert P. Fischelis Award in 2015 in honor of Robert Fischelis, a renowned leader of, of the pharmacy uh, profession for many decades and a generous benefactor of the Institute. We established the award to recognize an individual or an organization who has made extraordinary contributions to both the field of pharmacy history and the Institute. It's this combined focus on exceptional contributions to both the field of pharmacy history and significant contributions to the Institute that distinguishes the Fischelis Award from AIHP's other awards. Uh, and unlike AIHP's other awards, which are usually selected by, as Luke indicated, a specially formed committee of judges, the recipient of the Fischelis Award is selected by AIHP's board of directors. For 2021, the Institute, uh, the, the Board of Directors uh, awarded the Fischelis Award to Dr. Meta Lou Henderson. In selecting Dr. Henderson, the board cited her pioneering work to develop the history of women in pharmacy. In its letter to Dr. Henderson uh, announcing the award, the board stated, and I quote, thanks to your groundbreaking research and analysis, the, ro the role of women in the history of pharmacy profession and their many contributions to pharmacy practice is now far better understood and documented. Your work has filled important gaps in the history of pharmacy and pharmaceuticals and produced a far richer and more complete understanding of the profession's heritage, close quote. Indeed, it's no overstatement to say that no one has done more than Meta Lou Henderson to document and describe the history of women in pharmacy in the, in the pharmacy profession in the United States. Earlier historians have paid little attention to this topic, and before Meta Lou, there was virtually no comprehensive historical account of the role of women in pharmacy. Meta Lou's book, uh, American Women Pharmacists: Contributions to the Profession. profession published in 2002, was a groundbreaking book that filled this gaping hat, a gap in the literature. But her book was only part of her contribution to the field. She also uh, authored many important academical, academic articles that told the story of particular women in the profession or that documented uh, the work of uh, groups of women in segments of the profession. AIHP was pr privileged to publish many of these uh, articles in its journal, Pharmacy and History. These articles are themselves very important contributions to the field. But Meta Lou is also receiving the Fischelis Award for another reason, and that is for her contributions to AIHP as an organization. And here too, her contributions have been truly extraordinary. 30 years ago, Meta Lou do donated more than $20,000 to the Institute, money left over from an international symposium on the role of women in pharmacy. Those uh, funds are the corpus of what is today known as the AIHP Women in Pharmacy Fund, and those funds continue to generate income that helps to generate uh, the, that helps to fund AIHP's operations. Meta Lou made it letter, later made an, another important contribution to the institute when she donated to the uh, to the institute the research materials that she had accumulated in writing her book for the, on the history of women uh, in the pharmacy profession. This huge compilation of research material became the Meta Lou Henderson Women in Pharmacy Collection, which is one of the Institute's most prized possessions. Meta Lou lives in Tucson, Arizona. And while I was in Tucson in October, I had the pleasure of personally presenting the Fischelis Award to her. Her friends at the University of Arizona College of Pharmacy organized a very special presentation ceremony at the, at the College's uh, Museum of Pharmacy, uh, which uh, provided uh, a lovely and fitting venue for the event. Meta Lou had planned to be with us today, uh, but I'm sad to report that she is having some health issues this week, and she informed me yesterday that she's not feeling up uh, to participating today. 
but I exchanged emails with her this morning and she's on the mend uh, and will be back to normal soon. But in her, in her absence, I'll just say that AIHP is very pleased to recognize and honor uh, Dr. Meta Lou Henderson with the Facilish Awards for all she has done. She is truly a deserving recipient of this award. Clark? Thank you, Dennis. And I would like to add my personal congratulations to Meta Lou. She's one of the first friends I ever made when I got into the Institute uh, almost four decades ago. And uh, so it's most deserving, of, it's most deserving of this reward. And I too wish her a speedy, a speedy recovery. Um, moving on hey, to other, yes. Hey, this is Melissa. Would it be possible for me to just add a comment since Meta Lou wasn't able to join us today? Absolutely. Uh, this is Melissa Miracorrigan, and I'm a AIC board member. And it was my privilege and honor to champion Meta Lou's nomination and. What I want to share, I very much appreciate what Dennis shared about her background and, and the um, all the significant contributions and why she was selected, but also to let you know that there was such engagement among others who supported her nomination that immediately said yes, that they'd like to be a part of it. And one of the things that Meta Lou has done is brought these historical women in pharmacy to life. And just recently on a women in pharmacy event um, for Women Pharmacists Day a few weeks ago, she talked about Zeta Mary Cooper and Gloria Frankie and described both of them as her sisters. And so I think for all of us, for future generations, she has brought these historical figures who have made such important contributions to pharmacy, to life, and so that we could see the role that they have in the past, that they have in today, and then in, in shaping our future. So again, I just want to say congrats to Meta Lou, and we're so thrilled for her work with AIHP and that we were able to honor her this year. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. And it's timely that you comment because in honoring our retiring directors, I believe uh, Greg Bond has something he would like to say on your behalf, Melissa. Yes. Yes, thank you, Clark. And very good timing, Melissa. For, uh, thanks for chiming in with uh, more interesting, important material about why Metalu has been so important and why she got the Shales Award, or was awarded the, the Shales Award this year. Uh, as Clark said, Melissa is retiring from the HP Board of Directors at the end of her term at the end of 2021. Uh, over the last three years, I've enjoyed getting to know you, Melissa, through your service in the Board of Directors. And personally, I've been very proud that I've never held against you the fact that you're an Iowa person, not a Wisconsin person. I think I've been uh, very understanding of you being from Iowa instead of Wisconsin. But seriously, uh, I have had the opportunity to work with you on uh, several different projects during time on the board. Uh, Melissa has always prioritized and encouraged AIHP to improve its outreach and its promotional activities, particularly involving AIHP collections and AIHP programming. And you've always pushed us, Melissa, to be better at spreading the word about the good work we've been doing at AIHP. And specifically, you've really helped us improve our social media presence and our social media outreach. You, you know the value of social media in meeting people online where they are. You have ample experience and expertise you've shared with us about various social media platforms. And personally, it's been very helpful for me and I know for Naomi Rendina, who is our social media coordinator, to talk with you about strategies for social media campaigns, uh, to look for you for encouragement and advice. And uh, in part through your encouragement and your expertise and your advice, uh, AHP has been able to increase its Twitter following from about 80 followers in 2019 to more almost 1,600 last time I checked earlier this week. So I've really appreciated working with you and your uh, emphasis on social media and the ability to use social media to promote the Institute and to post the collections. But I've also had the great pleasure of working with you, Melissa, on several AIHP diversity, equity, and inclusion task force and committees over the last couple of years. Uh, I've always appreciated that you take very seriously the importance of building, a building and maintaining a welcoming atmosphere at AIHP, and also you strongly believe in uh, the need for AHP to support and encourage people to conduct research like Ben and Christian have been doing, like John Clark's been doing, about the many diverse, diverse voices in pharmacy's history. You've always been a great ally to me in helping to encourage AIHP to confront these sometimes difficult histories that are a heritage, as we know, of the legacies and the continuing realities of structural prejudice and discrimination. Uh, you really understand the importance of improving and remedying the existing gaps and silence in AHP archives and historical collections. 
And I've always appreciated working with you on, on those programs. I do wanna take a minute to recognize your hard work on the Melissa RX script podcast, which is not an AHP program, but uh, you've done a great job on the podcast, specifically incorporating the history of women in pharmacy. And I always enjoyed on the podcast, how you were able to bring in the history, uh, the, the relevant history of the, uh, of, of the topics you're talking about on the podcast. And I had the great joy of working with Melissa earlier this year on a, on a post for points about her interview with Meta Lou Henderson actually, where we were able to introduce or reintroduce people, uh, to points readers, to pioneers like Zeta Cooper and Gloria Frankie. And uh, I hope, Melissa, with your new exciting job at AACP that you will continue to find interest or continue to find time for your interest in history. Uh, we'd love to keep promoting your work at points. And I know AACP will benefit from your historical perspective. Uh, we're thrilled for your new, your new position, Melissa, at AACP, but we're gonna miss your passion for history and your strong advocacy for, advocacy for all things diversity, equity, inclusion at AHP. So good luck and do keep in touch from AACP. Thanks, Greg. Melissa, I know you're traveling and, and joining us uh, in your travels. Um, would you care to make any comments? Yeah, thank you, Clark. Um, and I, I'm smil well, smiling and tearing up with those thoughtful remarks, Greg. Um, thank you so much. And I left the great state of Iowa and I'm headed to um, Illini country. I'm going to be in Illinois for a meeting tomorrow related to a grant um, to help increase greater diversity in the health profession, specifically in pharmacy, and to address some policy issues related to uh, why students either wouldn't enter into pharmacy or um, stay in pharmacy school. So I'm looking forward to learning more about that. And I want to give a shout out to Bill Zelmer. Bill took me aside a couple years ago and mentioned AIHP, first encouraged me to become a member, which I did, and then a little while later encouraged me to join the Board of Governors, and it has been such a great experience the last few years. I want to say thank you to our outstanding board, our leadership that we've had um, over the last couple years, and welcoming Dennis in his new role, and then also welcoming the um, Luke in his role as historical director, and building on success. Um, it's just been very fascinating. I did enjoy my time in Madison and look forward to visiting again. And, you know, I, I think the future is really bright and we can't work on innovation and transformation without understanding our history, um, what that looks like. So I continue, I will continue to be um, engaged and uh, look forward to what's next. And I'm on 88 right now. And so apologies that I did drop off a little bit, but I had heard Christian and Ben and Yurik. I want to give a shout out to those two because that was an outstanding presentation. I heard the first part of it. Um, and I think it's important work that we need to be doing right now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, Beth, I understand you have a presentation to make uh, regarding Angela Long. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. This is Greg and I share an office, so um, we're having some feedback here. So I have the pleasure to say a few words about Angie. I've known Angie for over 26 years, and I know many of you have known her a lot, much longer than I have. Angie became a member of AIHP in 1994, and you can see the picture up on the screen, and has been a member of the board since 2016. I remember meeting Angie when we were still located in Chamberlain Hall. During our first meeting, we had a long conversation about the Kremers reference files, the importance of collecting and preserving the history of pharmacy. We also had a detailed discussion about graduate programs and museum work, particularly those in the DC area. The picture on the screen is of Angie working on with a collection in 94. Angie, you should know your place in history is safe. Your photograph and some other materials of you are now located in our A2 biographical files in the KRF. In the late 90s, Angie developed a logo for the financial Development Committee, which is on the screen. The Institute used this for many years to not only help promote the AIHP, but to raise much needed funds. The logo provided the Institute with a new look that in Angie's words, bring a certain elegance, sophistication, and uniqueness to the Institute and the history of pharmacy. When Angie came to, the, uh, came to Madison, which was periodically, we always knew where to find her. She was either eating at Kabul restaurant, which unfortunately is not there. And before finding her favorite Airbnb, she would stay what is now on campus, the Graduate Hotel. 
Some of Angie's highlights while she was on the board was the membership task force. And while you were even at USP, you worked with the Wisconsin Historical Society on the Tome. And you were working on this digitization project, which resulted in a strong MOU with, the, with AIHP and WHS in 2017. And we are all eternally grateful that you helped secure funding from USP for the International Congress for the History of Pharmacy meeting in DC. Um, Angie, you have a long connection with, D with Madison. Not only did you work here, um, but some of your family members are true Badgers as they have degrees from UW. And we hope that you will continue to be a part of the AIHP and get to Madison on a regular basis and perhaps bring your bike and do the horribly hilly hundreds. Um, we wish you good luck in your new endeavors and you will be missed on the board. Thank you, Beth. Angie, any response? Well, I was quite shocked to see this picture. <laughs> I remember it, but I, um, uh, it's, it's hard to believe that it's been almost 30 years uh, since that picture and since I discovered the magic in the Kremers reference files. And the, uh, as you mentioned, Beth, the Wisconsin Historic Society um, and our important collaboration. Um, thanks for mentioning all those things. Uh, the personal connection to Madison, my uh, husband has a graduate degree there and my daughter went to undergraduate. Uh, <laughs> so two badgers in the family for sure. And I credit, you know, my, um, my start um, of working with, uh, with or being in Madison to this particular trip. And it was pretty magical. But I ended up doing, you know, I've, um, as some of you know, I've transitioned <clears throat> out of USP, a career of over 25 years, or, or 25 years over a period of time, 17 years working there as an employee and the other years working as a, uh, as a consultant. And um, to, but I also uh, transitioned to public health and I also was able to connect my research in public health to uh, University of Wisconsin. So I feel that, you know, my career is complete and if not for um, Madison and the University of Wisconsin and all of its um, great offerings. I um, just am thrilled to have served as a board member under the leadership uh, first of Bill Zilmer and then of Clark. And I think my, um, my relationship with both of them go back to even before 94. So when I started with USP in 1990. So, um, and Greg, I can't um, forget as far as just the friendship that we enjoyed over all those years and just having the ability to serve on the search committee to find uh, Dennis as our new executive director. I've just been honored to be a part of the, this great enterprise and I look uh, forward to continuing my uh, involvement as a member. And ultimately when I retire, which is a little bit farther away than I would hope, <laughs> but. I hope to be in Madison more and enjoying all those great uh, aspects of Madison and also returning to the Kremers files where I just feel at home. So thank you very much for this great tribute. I'd like to add my uh, special personal thank you to both Angie and to Melissa. Uh, it has been a pleasure to get to know you over the years working with you and to <clears throat> thank you for sharing your talents and your uh, time and your dedicated service to, to the Institute. And I also wish you both uh, a long and healthy life and a fulfilling uh, career. I'm a little nervous about this next presentation. Um, Greg and I have been friends for uh, nearly 40 years. And uh, all I can say is, uh, Greg, be nice. <laughs> <laughs> you should have no worries at all, Clark. And also, I will be both nice and brief.
because I could spend a half an hour talking about all the things that you've done for the Institute. Well, here I'll, I'll begin. Um, in 1986, Glenn Sonnendecker wrote the following in his last report as AIHP Executive Director. With the aid of the Institute's first Teaching Improvement Award, W. Clark Ridgeway of West Virginia University is currently with us for graduate study at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and other work in the history of pharmacy. It is a pleasure to be associated with this talented young man and to introduce him at this annual meeting. Well, what um, uh, Glenn didn't say there is when Clark came here in 85, I think it was, as, as the first recipient of this um, award, um, it was one heck of a cold and nasty winter. And uh, since then, um, uh, I think Clark has resisted the temptation to return to Madison uh, in the winter months uh, for, good, for good reason. Uh, since the 80s, and I say this, it's 30 years, as Clark says, it's nearly 40 years, really. Um, I, I, first of all, I just want to point out that, that picture on the far left there. That is Clark there, by the way. And uh, it's a great picture because it has uh, Clark and uh, Bob Berkey, and that's the back of Bill Zelmer there. Uh, and unfortunately cropped out, and there's Michael Harris. So you've got four of the, you might say, the great um, contributors to um, the Institute over, the, uh, over these many years. Uh, in, in one uh, captured in one picture, and um, you know since that time, uh, Clark's been one of our most active members. You know, serving on our board, working on a wide variety of committees, many pretty much every committee, standing committee we've ever had, taking over as treasurer from the legendary uh, Lou Vitero, and then answering the call to serve as AIHP president, um, which he's just finishing up. I guess in just a few minutes, Clark. Uh, looking forward to that. Now, during my own 32 years uh, at the helm of AIHP, uh, Clark was my go-to guy um, when I needed help, when I needed someone to serve on a committee. And I don't think, Clark, you ever turned me down um, for any reasonable request, which is really, I, 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 I thank you from the, the depths of my heart. Also, Clark has been one of the greatest advocates for the Institute. Uh, getting us new members, which is uh, a wonderful thing for board members to do, putting in my pitch there. Um, and as I said, a really valued advisor and a very close and dear friend um, who uh, my, the friendship is one, of the, one that I value very, very highly among all, all my friends. Now I'm choking up. Um, so I'll just conclude uh, as I start to choke up here, um, Clark. Uh, thanks so much for your, um, your service and your involvement in the Institute. And like others have said, we all look forward to your enthusiastic um, and positive presence uh, in the future uh, after you step down as the AIHP president. So thanks, bud. Greg, thank you. And, uh... Give me a minute here. I actually grew that beard in response to the Wisconsin winter that year. Uh, I had been clean shaven prior to that, and my kids didn't recognize me when I came home for the first break <laughs> after I was here. Um, Greg, thanks for a lot more credit than I probably deserve. No. Um, you know, I feel really fortunate over the last uh, 36 years with AIHP who have met so many really wonderful people from across the country and really around the world and uh, to have learned so very much about the history of our profession. Um, I hope in some small way I've been able to contribute to the betterment of the Institute and, uh, and at least to uh, paraphrase Hippocrates to have done no harm. Um, so I, I look forward to working with the Institute any way that I can uh, in, in the years ahead. So, thank you, Greg. Thank you. Greatly beloved. It's now time for the installation of new officers and directors. So we have uh, an individual who's to be an elected by an institute member as an officer, and they will begin their service at the very conclusion of this annual business meeting. 
My incoming president is Dr. John D. Gravenstein, retired global director of medical affairs for Merck Vaccines. He led medical affairs and scientific policy activities. <clears throat> Uh, for Merck's global vaccine enterprise that provided 150 million doses annually for 12 vaccines, 150 million. Wow. As a pharmacist, he has ex experience in over 50 countries. He has served on multiple committees advising the US government and he's published over 400 articles and nine books, primarily on topics of immunization, public health and leadership. Previously, as a colonel in the U.S. Army, Dr. Gravenstein directed the Military Vaccine Agency and oversaw the Defense Department immunization programs for 9 million troops, retirees, and family members spread across four continents and dozens of ships at sea. Dr. Gravenstein has served on AIHP's Board of Directors since 2018. He received his pharmacy degree from Duquesne University in 1980, master's degree in education from Boston University in 1988, and his doctorate in epidemiology at the University of North Carolina in 1999. The following individual has been elected by Institute members as an at-large member of the board of directors for a three-year term, Dr. John E. Clark. Dr. Clark is an assistant professor at the University of uh, South Florida College of Pharmacy, where he also serves as a director of experiential education. Professor Clark is a past president of the Association of Black Health Systems Pharmacists and is the author of Early Education of African American Pharmacists, 1870 to 1975, published by Bookstand Publishers uh, just this year and it traces the history of now defunct African-American pharmacy schools formed during the late 19th and early 20th centuries and the role they played in bringing a significant number of African-American pharmacists into the profession. Dr. Clark will be receiving the ASHP Board of Directors Distinguished Leadership Award at this year's ASHP Mid-Year Clinical Meeting that will be held in just a few weeks. Professor Clark earned a BS in pharmacy from Texas Southern University College of Pharmacy, a PharmD from Florida A&M University. He earned a master's in pharmaceutical administration from Wayne State University and completed his residency training at Detroit General Hospital. I will now ask each of these two individuals to affirm that they understand the duties of the position to which they have been elected or appointed that they promise to fulfill those duties to the best of their ability, and that they will work faithfully to help AIHP fulfill its purposes. Gentlemen, as I call your name individually, please indicate by saying, I do to so affirm. John Gravenstein. I do. John Clark. I so affirm. Thank you, gentlemen. Congratulations. I hereby announce that these two individuals have been duly installed to their positions on the AIHP Board of Directors. And again, thank you for agreeing to serve on the governing body of the Institute. Dr. Uh, Gravenstein, I believe you will honor us now with a presidential address. Clark, thanks very much. And uh, I'm. let me start by saying I'm glad that I now have to sign my uh, uh, emails and what have you as John G, because having John C uh, added to the board is, is delightful. Uh, thank you most sincerely for entrusting me with the presidential rudder of our beloved institute, the American Institute of the History of Pharmacy. Uh, my thanks to outgoing President Clark Ridgway for allowing me to peer over his shoulder and learn as he ably led AIHP during the last two years. And I'm also grateful for the ongoing mentorship of past President Bill Zelmer. Uh, you've heard other presidents say that on their first day in office, they would do this or that. Well, on my first day as AIHP president, I'd like to form a presidential advisory committee of, of the predecessors uh, who are willing, um, recognizing the accumulated talent and wisdom among AIHP past presidents. I'd like to ask them to join me on a teleconference a couple times a year to 
advise on the Institute's current needs and its future directions and keep me on a productive path. Before we go further, there are many other people who deserve thanks for the hard work they contributed to the Institute this year. First, thanks to the ultra dedicated Institute staff. I've seen their fr the fruits of their tireless labors since I joined the board in uh, 2018. I delight in their pro professionalism and I appreciate them as friends. Thanks also to my fellow directors and to each of the Institute's crucial volunteers, members of our committees and task forces, the editor two editorial boards, now, now the editorial board for history of pharmacy and pharmaceuticals. Contributions of time by our volunteers are truly essential to our progress. As you know, the mission of the Institute is to advance knowledge and understanding of the history of pharmacy and pharmaceuticals. Preparing for this address, I spent time at our website, AIHP.org, exploring the many resources and programs AIHP offers. What a cool association we are. Thanks to the contributions of so many people attending today and not able to attend. What a wonderful gift to the profession of pharmacy and to American society. Many members of the Institute proudly call themselves history buffs. We love historical exploration in great measure because it helps us understand the world we live in. Many also would agree that we pursue and that the Institute pursues practical applications of historical knowledge. I refer to this as history to inform progress. We know that historical work improves our future. AIHP matters. I've, I've been speaking for some minutes now and have yet to say the word that, that summarizes nearly two years of our recent history, pandemic. Historians marvel at the relative lack of written commentaries uh, on the uh, uh, great influenza pandemic of 1918, 1919. Partially this dearth is because the Great War, World War I, caused far more noise than the influenza pandemic, simultaneous. Uh, but the historical record is clear that influenza virus caused far more deaths than the bullets and all the other armaments of World War I and World War II combined. Viruses are dangerous things. Fear not, historians will have ample material to assess our own responses to the present COVID-19 pandemic. You will surely recall 18 months ago how access to pharmacies and pharmacists was considered one of the privileged forms of social interaction while so much of society shut down as the virus rampaged. For pharmacy as a profession and pharmacy as sites of care, the COVID-19 pandemic brought substantive expansion of scopes of practice. Future historians are gonna have a field day assessing how governments, scientists, and the public alternately praised or damned various means to treat or prevent COVID-19 hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, and less skeptically now, dexamethasone, fluvoxamine, antiviral compounds, convalescent plasma, monoclonal antibodies, and vaccines, both novel and traditional vaccines. How integrally uh, pharmaceuticals are caught up in the whole pandemic. And, and evidence that gold standard randomized clinical trials have been tripped up by pseudo evidence. Millions of people found that they had no need for evidence whatsoever to guide their, their behavior. Anthropologists are gonna study our contemporary history for a long time to come. And clearly the humanity of a pandemic sometimes bears more weight than the science of it. And I have to ask as a question, is this the first time in history that a medication category is named Oxford Dictionary Word of the Year? For 2021, the word is VAX. During the pandemic, pharmacies and pharmacists grew their collaborations with public health departments in breadth and in depth across the country. It'll be important for the 50 states, for Puerto Rico and the other US territories to document in their regional histories how the pandemic harmed the public and opened the doors for pharmacy locally. Federal authorities superseded more limited professional authorities at the state level. The feds overriding state prerogatives largely without precedent. 
Pharmacists nationwide received remarkable new authorities from uh, the Department of Health and Human Services via amendments to the Public Readiness and Emergency Preparedness Act, the PREP Act, which authorized COVID-19 testing by pharmacists, interns, and technicians, COVID-19 vaccination by pharmacists, interns, and technicians, any vaccination indicated for children three to 18 year old, years old by pharmacists, interns, and technicians overriding some states, authorized pharmacy vaccination by technicians, authorized ordering and administration of monoclonal antibody therapies by infusion by pharmacists. One example of the beneficial effect of pharmacists as pandemic responders was the striking effect of pharmacists administering many of the first COVID-19 vaccinations to residents of long-term care facilities almost a year ago now, December in, of 2020 and January of 2011, or 2021, sorry. A, a, a page one graphic in the New York Times in February, 2021, looks like a waterfall. De it shows death rates among long-term care residents plummeting as a direct result of their pharmacists vaccinating them. When the final tally is com compiled, pharmacists will be justly acclaimed for the magnitude of their contributions to mitigate and control this pandemic we are suffering through. I invite you to contribute to the AIHP COVID-19 Pandemic Pharmacy Historical Documentation Project. The Institute is preserving pharmacy experiences during the pandemic to benefit future historians. We seek stories, photos, videos, artifacts, other documentation of the pandemic's effects on society. What next? Speakers before me today reviewed AIHP's many accomplishments and contributions over the last year. Excellent work, valuable, important, crucial. What do we do next? I adopt as my priorities as your president the strategic priorities adopted by the board of directors at the August 21 meeting you heard earlier, the strategic priorities to increase accessibility to our collections, increase revenue by, over, by at least $50,000 a year, increase partnerships and collaborations, and to take diversity, equity, and inclusion into every piece of what AIHP does. And today's lecture was a superb example of that. Importantly, the board and staff identified 16 action steps to make those four priorities come to come into fruition. It'll take a lot of work from the board and from the staff. We also need the volunteers from the people watching today. Um, it's all useful work and we will endeavor to make it fun too. AIHP wants to partner, we want to collaborate, we want to contribute, we want to help. We need arms, legs, brains, and dollars. To wrap up, we need you, we invite you and the organizations you belong to, to document and share your COVID-19 histories. Please rummage around and take advantage of all the resources at AIHP.org. Thank you for all you offer in time, talent, and treasure. Thank you for your contributions to our work. Please actively encourage your friends and colleagues to become members of AIHP. Why join? What, does, what, 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 what do you get out of membership? We pursue history to inform progress. Thank you very much. We're gonna have a lot of fun in the years to come. Thank you, John. Thank you. I think I can speak for everyone on the call today that uh, we all agree AIHP will be in great hands in the years to come uh, under your tutelage. Thank you. Um, it's now time on the agenda for new business and open forum. Um, it's an opportunity to discuss or ask questions on anything concerning AIHP. Um, so if you have comments or questions, please again, choose the, uh, the chat or at this point of the day, we can use open mic. Are there any? Greg Bond, are you seeing any? Nothing come across in the chat at this point, Clark. Okay, very good. Well, a reminder to be checking your mailbox soon for the premier issue of the History of Pharmacy and Pharmaceuticals and your 2022 AIHP calendar. 
Uh, we encourage all to take part in AIHP's online roundtable entitled Contesting Cannabis that will air uh, December the 8th from 1 to 2.30 Central Standard Time, and the link is already posted on the AIHP website. Uh, before we adjourn, I wish to thank all of our speakers for their reports, our staff, Dennis, Luke, Greg, Beth, Greg, for all the time and efforts behind the scenes on putting together today's meeting. That takes a lot of work. And to all of our attendees for taking the time to making AIHP a part of your day. And I can't resist one final act, President, having heard so much about Badger this and Badger that, know that you have a friend among the hills in West Virginia. <laughs> having completed the scheduled order of business and hearing there is no further business for the assembly to consider at this time, I now declare this meeting adjourned. Stay well and we will convene again via teleconference next November. Goodbye all. Thanks, Clark. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you, Clark.